I'm Stacey Martin and today we're going to talk about human immunity. So first we're going to talk about non-specific defence against disease. The human body has an innate immune system. This is made up of a series of non-specific defences. The defences are a protector against infection and they are not directly purely, directed purely at any one pathogen. There are three levels of defence against pathogens. The first two are non-specific. So first we're going to look at the skin. As you can see there's diagrams there giving you all the different layers of the skin. But we're going to talk about the intipumuratory system, which is three layers of the skin. The epidermis, the dermis and the hypodermis. The epidermis prevents the penetration of microbiological organisms and chemical irritants and toxins. It absorbs and blocks solar and ionised radiation as well as inhibiting water loss. The dermis consists of an irregular network of connective tissue, collagen and coarse elastic fibres. The fibres provide the skin with strength and elasticity. And then the final one is the hypodermis, which is a subcutaneous layer. The next section we're going to talk about is what is an infection. An infection is an invasion of the body by microorganisms. These microorganisms are not normally found in the body. They are normally allocated in one region but can, speak, can spread. They can multiply and in turn affect the whole body. Microorganisms can live naturally in the body. Two examples of this are bacteria within the mouth or bacteria within the intestine. The four main causes of infection are bacteria, as we've said, so they are a single organism. They're responsible for illness responsible for diseases such as cellulitis, strep throat, urinary tract and tuberculosis. A virus is a smaller bacteria. It relies on a host for reproduction. It causes many diseases, example colds, HIV and AIDS. Fungi is a surface of skin disease. It can also cause infection to the lungs or the nervous system, for example, athlete's foot. Parasites, they're a cause of conditions such as malaria. These are transmitted through mosquito bites and other parts of these parasites can be transmitted through animal faeces. Methods of transmission for these are either direct contact, indirect contact, insect bites and food contamination. So direct contact is the easiest way to catch most infections. For example, person to person, by a touch, a kiss, a cough, sneezing and sexual contact. The carrier might not know that they have that infection before they pass it on to you. Animal to person is where the uninfected person is bitten or scratched by an infected animal or through animal faeces or urine. And then finally, mother to unborn child is transmitted through the umbilical cord. Indirect contact is where the infected person touches or sneezes on an object and then the uninfected person then touches this and becomes infected from what they have. Insect bites. One of the most common methods of transmission, are, these carriers are known as vectors, for example a mosquito. One of the most common diseases for insect bites is malaria. Then finally, food contamination. This is another common method of transmission. The infection or disease can be passed through food or drink. For example, e, example, e. coli. This can be due to uncooked or unwashed food. So next, how is skin a barrier to infection? The skin is the largest organ of the body. Its physical structure prevents pathogens and infectious agents, such as environmental toxins, from entering the body. It has a waterproof mechanical barrier to create a layer of protection. So the role of inflammation in infections. Any injury or infection to the skin will cause inflammation. Inflammation is a cellular response to damage or infection. Once this process has begun, it will continue until the underlying infection has hit, hit, healed. At the site of the infection, a substance called pus is produced. This is a debris of the fight between the immune system and the infection agent. This is a picture called inflames. It gives you the five different areas of inflammation. So the tissue within the infected area becomes heated. So it becomes red, red in colour and warm to the touch. This is due to large amounts of blood reaching the surface. We then get 
the redness from that. The tissue then becomes swollen, so where it says here, swelling. This is due to the amount of blood and proteins that are attracted towards the infection. Then the pain. The affected area becomes painful. This is from mechanical pressure that is applied to the nerve cells, which could then mean uh, loss of function in certain areas, such as like dementia or depression. The effectiveness of barriers to infection via body orifices. So we have the mucous membranes, the gastrointestinal system, nasal cavities and airways, and the urinary tract. The mucous membrane lines the surface of the ears, eyes, nose, sinuses, mouth, throat, gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, the urogenital tract and the vaginal tract. These are the main interface between external and internal environment. It protects the infectious agents such as pathogens from entering the body. The gastrointestinal system. This contains a series of barriers including stomach acid, pancreatic enzymes, bile and intestinal secretions. It has powerful acidic and alkaline secretions that act to protect the system. The pH of the stomach acids are generally too low for most bacteria to survive. The nasal cavity and airways. Many pathogens enter through here, but they can be filtered out before passing the barrier between the body and external environment by blowing the nose or coughing. The microorganisms can enter through the nasal, nasal cavities and become stuck to the mucus. Within the urinary tract, there are many effective barriers to infection. The bladder is protected by the urethra and this is the tube that drains the urine. Frequent movement of urine from the bladder to out of the body effectively washes out any pathogens. The role of the thymus, lymph nodes and lymphatic ducts. Um, the Thymus is a pink lobulated, oh no, sorry, <laughs> the pink lobulated lymphoid organ. It's located in the neck and thoracic cavity, organ of the endocrine and lymphatic system, part of the endocrine system. It secretes several hormones and produces and matures T cells and lymphocytes. T cells are produced in the bone marrow, white blood cells are transferred to the bloodstream. Continues to grow throughout childhood but reaches maximum size prior to puberty. The reduction in the elderly means that they're more susceptible to diseases and then also a restricted production of T cells. Lymph nodes. These are part of the lymphatic system. As you can see, there's a cross section photo there. They're bean shaped objects covered by a capsule of dense connective tissues. Humans have between five and six hundred of these. They work like filters for bacteria, parasites and viruses brought through the lymphatic vessels. They contain lymphocytes and macrophages. Lymph is a colourless white blood cell solution that filters through them. Lymph is not pumped through the body by the heart, it is forced through the movement of the body. And it leaves through efferent vessels which are larger, larger than afferent vessels. These vessels contain valve, valves that prevent backflow from the lymph. The role of the macrophage is in removing pathogens or inert particles. Versatile large white blood cells that play many roles. They are of vital importance to the immune system. They're formed in response to the accumulation of dead or damaged cells to an infection. They have the ability to find and consume particles including bacteria, fungi, parasites and viruses. They come from white blood cells known as monocytes produced by stem cells in the bone marrow. It uses a process called phagocytosis to get rid of unwanted particles. Again, here's a picture of one of them on a cross section. So macrophages can modify to form different structures to combat different infections. When a microbe has been digested, they produce antigens that, that act as a warning to white blood cells. The pathogens are there. The white blood cells then gather and form another part of the body's immune response. The immune system remembers pathogens are there, so antibodies Antibodies can be sent directly to the site if reinfection occurs. Phagocytosis. The process used by macrophages to engulf or ingest other cells and particles. The most important part of phagocytosis, as without this, our bodies will be left with bacteria and viruses that could make us ill. During inflammation, monocytes change and become macrophages. A dead cell or virus or bacteria is engulfed in a phagosome. This then fuses with a lysosome. Once this has happened, cellular enzymes destroy this ingested particle. 
Some of the organic components of the particle are used up by the cell. The ones that are not used are exported by exocytosis. Some macrophages are used to remove dead cells, whilst others aid immunity by engulfing bad microbes and particles. Acquired immunity and sensitivity to antigens. Acquired immunity is not present at birth, it is learned. It is often called also specific immunity. This is when the body learns over time in response to remembrance of specific pathogens and in response to the environment around you. The body's immune system is a learned response. It determines the best way to attack this antigen by creating antibodies. A memory is created, so if you're reinfected, your immune system will attack to that special antigen, specific antigen that the body previously encountered. Active, there are active and passive mechanisms. So the antigen sensitivity, we have hypersensitivity, autoimmunity and failure to self-tolerance. Hypersensitivity is a pathological immune response to repeated exposure to the same antigen disease. Autoimmunity is a response of the adaptive immune system to self-antigens occurring when self-tolerance mechanism fails. And then finally, there's failure to self-tolerance. The roles of the different immune cells and Im immunoglobins. Leukocytes are white blood cells. They are a key element in the immune system. They're involved with defending the body against infections and foreign bodies. There are five different types, all produced within the bone marrow. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Then we look at immunoglobins. These act as an antibody. They're arranged into Y shapes, as you can see on these diagrams. They're produced by plasma cells and lymphocytes. There are five chains of these, the IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE and IgD. So we'll just talk about those a little more. The IgG is the main immunoglobin in the blood. It makes up 70 to 75% of the total immunoglobins in your body. The subclasses that cross the placenta are responsible for the protection of your baby in the first few months of life. IgA, this provides antibody protection on mucosal surfaces it's found in secretions, tears, sweat, saliva, nasal fluids, lung fluids, genitourinary and gastrointestinal tract. The IgM is present on the surface of immature B cells, the first one to take part in the immune response. It's important in controlling bacteria that enter your bloodstream. The IgE, this increases during allergic reaction. The main immunoglobin that responds to infection from parasites, the IgD. This is present on the surface of your B cells, stimulating them to produce cells to manufacture antibodies. Tolerance to your own tissue rejection of transplanted organs. So first we'll talk about recognising yourself and non-self. So this is where your antigens allow your immune system to recognise which antigens are self and non-self, so they only attack non-self. Two factors which allow the immune system to distinguish between self and non-self are MHCI and MHC, sorry, MHC1 and MHC2. Organ transplant rejection. Due to different antigens, the recipient's immune system can recognise the organ as being non-self. Organs not matched closely can also trigger rejection. The tissue typing allows the tissues or organs to be matched closely. And they have monoclonal antibodies. The three types of rejection are hyperacute, chronic and acute. Hyperacute rejection, which occurs a few minutes after the transplant, this is when the antigens are completely unmatched. Chronic, this can take place over many years once you've had the transplant. And acute, it may occur any time from the first week to three months after your transplant. Active and passive immunity provided by vaccinations. A vaccination is like a training course for our immune system. It prepares our body to fight disease. Certain molecule, mo <coughs> molecules from the pathogen are introduced into the body. Then our immune system is triggered into fighting it by the lymphocytes, producing antibodies to fight antigens. Active immunity, there are a few side effects. So firstly, natural active immunity. The person's exposed to a live pathogen, they develop the disease and then they become immune. The T cells in the bloodstream attach to the pathogen. B cells create the antibody that attack and kill that pathogen. The B cells then remember the antibody, giving long-term resistance and even sometimes immunity. 